A very warm good morning to all of you. So today I am going to give a talk on a topic which was most uh, pertinent with respect to this training program. That is transcriptome, a powerful tool for elucidating mechanism of stress tolerance. So I have divided my talk into two parts. One part I will be talking about different basics of this transcriptome different platforms which one should use and what precaution one has to take in order before planning to go for transcriptome. And another part I will show you some of the results which we achieve here in this division so that by seeing at least you will be motivated to take this particular technique in your own research work. My first slide I think this is uh, uh, I have already explained when I was giving talk on proteome. So here omics, now you all know the term how it was coined, different subsections of omic. So transcriptome is one of them. So this transcriptome basically it signifies all the RNA molecules and non-coding RNAs which are present in a particular sample at a specific event of time. So when you are going to uh, analyze, when you are going to identify all those sequences, so then you can claim that this is a transcriptome of that particular tissue. If you see the term transcriptome means transcript plus omics, means you are going to identify transcript in a high throughput manner. So if you see the workflow for uh, uh, next generation sequencing, so there are three main steps under this NGS. First is library preparation. So once you have a sample with you, so the first thing which you have to do is you have to prepare a library. Once you prepare a library, then next is instrument based sequencing. So once you sequence, you will get lot of reads. It will be thousand and thousand of read will be with you. Then you need to have a different softwares or high computing servers for analyzing those data. So these are the three main steps when you talk of NGS. Now if you take one by one library preparation, so there are different steps under library preparation and most of the time as you all know, Illumina is one of the giant in this area. So they have all these steps, so different kits are available, so all these steps are kit based. So once you have a kit, like you have a TrueSec library preparation kit, so once you have a kit, then kit based steps you can follow and you can make a good quality library. So if, you're, if you see here, there are three uh, steps in this library preparation. First is fragmentation of your sample. Once you fragment this, then you have to add a specific adapter sequence, which is specific to the platform which you are going to use. So maybe in subsequent slides, I will show you different type of platforms which one can prefer, what are the pros and cons of those platforms. So first is that you are going to fragment your sample, second is you are going to add an adapter sequence at both the end which is a specific to the platform which you are going to use. And third is once you add an adapter at both the end, then you have to amplify or you have to sequence that library. So once library is sequenced, then you will have n number of bases with you. Then you have to align those bases and you have to characterize that. If you see the platforms, so these are some of the list of platforms which are available with us. If you start with the ROS, we have 454 ROS platform, we have ROS Flexa platform, uh, you have a HiSeq platform and under HiSeq also you have different types of platform like HiSeq 1000, 2000, Nexi. Then you have a solid based platform, you have a ion proton, you have a pack bio. Now if you compare uh, ROS platform. So the best part was the advantage of this platform was that uh, it used to give a long read length and pyro sequencing was the basis for this. But the disadvantage was high error rate. So when you are doing sequencing, this is one of the uh, worst problem attached with NGS that we expect that error rate should be low. It is something like when you are sequencing your gene and suppose if lot of error is there, so it will be difficult to use that sequence. Same thing happens here. So our objective is whatever chemistry you are going to use, but then error rate should be low, right? So this was the problem with ROS. Then this company again, he devised a ROS Flexa system, 454 Flexa system. If you see again here, pyro sequencing was the basic principle. Read length was high, but then again, error rate. So somehow it was not rectified. Then if you see high seek, Illumina. So Illumina also come out with a technology reversible 
uh, terminator technology and they developed different variants of this platform. The advantage with Illumina was that it was very high throughput, it used to take less time to sequence, but then the issue was short read length. Right? We always, because if you have a short read length, so aligning is very tough task. Right? We always prefer to have a long read length. Then uh, Solid and Ion Proton, they also discovered their uh, platform based on ligation and then based on the proton, but then there were several issues associated with these platforms and they were not much popular. Then comes PacBio. So some uh, four years back, PacBio was like a, a buzzing word. Uh, because of cost. So, in case of packed bio instrument, cost was little bit less as compared to the Illumina. Real time sequencing was the basic principle behind this and longest read length was possible, but then the problem of error rate was there. Right? So, now we have third generation NGS platform available like you have ion torrent, you have a packed bio, you have a, a Oxford nanopore. So, out of this now Oxford Nanopore is coming in a big way because of its low cost per sample. So, if you see the Illumina, so Illumina based platform, so this is widely used almost in all the research and then private sectors, Illumina based platform is uh, widely used and Illumina company is also doing this business in a very aggressive mode. If you see the different steps like you have a library construction, you have a cluster generation, you have a sequencing and then last is data analysis. So, library construction as I told, so we, we have a specific dedicated kit for this. You purchase that kit, you prepare your high quality sample, you analyze the quality of RNA as I told during the uh, practicals and once you analyze the quality then use the kit to prepare the library. Library means you are going to fragment it, you are going to add a specific adapter sequence which will be specific to the instrument which you are going to use. Many times it happens that we will give a thought that if I have to do transcriptome, so the first thing which will come in your mind is prepare sample and outsource it. When you prepare sample and outsource, so that person will charge you something which will be very high and with same cost you can complete 10 or 12 or 20 samples. So, when you are doing most of these steps at with your own hand, the cost per sample will be very low, very low. But the lacuna is most of the time, most of the lab, they love to outsource this. The reason is because instrument is not easily accessible, because we need to have accessible to NGS platform instrument. So, that is the problem, but now government institutions they are also coming in a big way and we have common facility with all these instruments in almost all the premier institutes. So, in this PUSA campus also at NIPB, we have a facility of Illumina and ROS at one common platform and they are running in a PPP mode. Right. So, once you prepare a library which is basically a kit based, so if you know the kit, you purchase this, prepare your sample and then easily you can make your library. You can analyze the quality of the library and once your library is good, then you can go for cluster generation and then running. So, once you run it, you will get lot of reads. So, once you have a read, then real challenge starts and real challenge in case of transcriptome is data analysis. So, most of us are not competent. So, we need to have access to high computing server to analyze the data which you have generated. Most of the time what happens is when you open your data in a normal computer, your computer drive will crash out because they cannot take that much load. So, this is one of the biggest problem with transcriptome. So, Illumina as here you can see in diagrammatical form also I have shown different steps. Uh, this is uh, user friendly and then very popular among the research arena. So, people they are using this chemistry uh, for the NGS. Another which I told uh, which is the uh, buzzing word nowadays is Oxford Nanopore. As I told, uh, so by paying nominal uh, even uh, 12,000 rupees per sample you can sequence. Uh, this was discovered in the year 2012 and if you see it measure or the basic principle is that it that all the bases, four bases are tagged with a uh, a tag is there detectable tag polyphosphates and when it passes through a nanopore which is basically a conical like structure, it will be a small chip which has a small pore and when this sample goes inside that, 
So all your four bases are tagged with different pyrophosphates. So that will give a specific current signal which is detected by the instrument and then it will tell you which base is this. And you will be surprised to know that we do not require a full fledged room, full fledged facility to do this Oxford nanopore. It is a small chip like this. I will put here itself on the desk. I will connect my phone, smartphone and there is an app. So once you feed your sample, close it and easily you can see this sequence suddenly it will start picking up. So based on the sequence in your strand, it will start showing you the sequence and then the advantage is that it has a long read length, right. So this is one part and then the time of sequencing is less. So see any researchers who is planning to go for transcriptome require three things, long read length, short time, low cost and Oxford fulfill all these three requirements. Now, <coughs> Uh, I think uh, just I asked you many of you have not done this transcriptome, but then the real challenge in case of transcriptome is most of the time scientists does not know how to analyze the data which I have received from the companies. So most of the time company people they will run, they will give you data, but we do not know what are the parameters, what are the statistical tool through which I can analyze whether this data is correct or not, the quality is good or not, whether we can use it in a downstream process or not. So there are different tools through which you also by sitting in your room you can analyze your data and you can say whether this is good or not. For example, there is a Q score term which is freight quality and there is a term associated with this like Q10, Q20, Q10 means one error out of 10 base score, Q20 means one error out of 100, Q30 means one out of 1000. So, 1 out of 1000 means or 1 out of 100 means almost 99.9% .9 accuracy is there. So, we need that one. So, if this value is high, it means the data which has been given to you is almost 99.9% .9 accurate. So, Q score is one of the most popular uh, method to analyze the quality of data which you have received from the company people and this they cannot manipulate because this is instrument based. So, once they give you your data, the first thing which we should do is you just open it and try to find out where is the Q score, Q score for this data. Another term is N50 value. This is a very common term used. So, when you see the transcriptome data, maybe in coming slides, I will show you some of the uh, results. So, N50 value will be there. This represents the minimum contig length needed to cover 50 percent of the genome. So, if N50 value is high, it means the quality of data is good. The third parameter is you can also analyze based on the TIN number. Like if you see when I, when I was explaining you the total RNA isolation and quality, I use the term RNA integrity number. So like that we have a transcript integrity number which will tell you the quality of the data which we have received from the NGS platform, right. And other than this fast QC, this is also a software which is very popular. Uh, this will not help you to convert the form of data which you have received, but it will also tell you the quality of data which you have received from the instrument. Other than this, some of the people, those who are expert in this area, they are also using box plot method. They are also using principal component analysis to analyze the quality of transcriptome data. But for a layman or those who are not expert in this software based area, so at least Q score or T number or N50 value that by visual observation we can see and we can predict whether the data is further usable or not. So that was brief about the transcriptome. Now let me take you uh, to the use of this transcriptome. Basically my, as I told my crop is wheat and we have used this transcriptome in an exhaustive manner in wheat for solving a problem of heat stress uh, in case of wheat. So if you see this slide, so few uh, quote are there like climate change make food crop less nutritious. So even a nature they published a paper where they claim that CO2 is increasing uh, day by day and because of this we are depleting beneficial nutrient from the grains, right. And the uh, biggest sufferer of this is wheat. 
The biggest problem with wheat is it is highly heat labile. Even if there is a fluctuation of 1 or 2 degrees Celsius in temperature uh, during the grain filling, so it has very uh, a devastating effect on the quality of the starch which is going to be filled inside the grain. So basically we used to call it as terminal heat. Those who are from Punjab, they might be knowing that 2 years back there was a problem, uh, regionally they used to call it as Fuka disease. Fuka means air was filled inside the endosperm rather than starch and all this happens because there is fluctuation in the temperature, right. Uh, if you see the wheat, so wheat almost covers almost 12 percent of the um, uh, like carbohydrate which we are taking in our diet and it almost provide 40 percent of the calorie. If you see the compositions, uh, it is as I think we have already uh, had one talk on this. So, it is not less than any other nutrient though it is. Uh, so, if you compare with millets, the story is different, but then it is equally comparable with other nutritious or nutri cereals. Uh, if you see the production, so last year we crossed even uh, 101 million ton and it was flashed up by the government of India also and different institutes also. But the biggest problem in spite of all this production, the biggest problem is terminal heat. So, because of this a few researches had been done at different institutes even at uh, uh, we have a division called SISKRA. So, they conducted a research from last 4 5 years and they could conclude that if there is an increase of 1 degree Celsius temperature. So, there is a reduction of 4 percent in the yield of wheat, right. And uh, if, if there is a heat stress, so it will have a devastating effect on the source and sink ratio of wheat. It means photosynthetic rate will also dip because of this photosynthetic translocation will be hampered. Because of this there will be partial filling of a starch inside the endosperm and because of which you will get a shriveled grains. So, uh, we also did some of the work here at our lab and if you see here, so three different same photographs. First is basically the pollen. So, that is pollen under control condition. Here you can easily make out different uh, ridges on the surface of the pollen and you will be surprised to know that all these ridges have a small pore at the tip and these pores are packed with starch. So, when these pores are plugged with a starch, this pollen will be viral, it will sit on the stigma and it will start growing, it will start showing the pollen tube. But when there is a fluctuation of temperature even uh, for 1 or 2 degree Celsius, so this starch plugging will come out and once pore is open, this pollen will be flashed. And once pollen is flashed, even though it will sit on the stigma, it will not able to grow. So, once pollen is not growing means there will be improper fertilization and if fertilization is not there, you cannot expect seed. Same thing happens in case of FUCA. Similarly, second uh, SEM you can see this is the stigma. So, in case of control, so you have a very uh, fluffy stigma. It is very integrated, intact, composed and very fluffy like. But when the plant was challenged with heat stress, so easily you can see the stigma was interwoven, it was open and it was something like unclasped. So, when a pollen comes and sit over there, so it will not get the nourishment which is required for the growth of the pollen. So, once that nourishment is not there, pollen will not able to grow. If pollen will not grow, you cannot expect the fertilization. Third is the granules. So, first uh, SEM if you see this is the starch granule under control condition. So, starch will be very bold, very globular and, and when you make chapati out of that, it will be very palatable. But when a plant is exposed to heat stress, so most of the time this starch granule will be pleated one. It will be pleated, it will be small, it will be defragmented and because of this lot of empty pockets will be developed. And once empty pocket is there, so grain will not able to take the proper structure and shape and once grain will not take the proper structure, so it will be shriveled one. Shriveled one means when you make chapati, it will be not so tasty and palatable. Uh, if you compare the genome of wheat with that of other model plants and closely related crops. So, here easily you can make out wheat has approx 16 or 16.5 GB genome size. But if you compare with barley or maize or for the sake Arabidopsis. So, now this is pictorial representation, but easily you can make out it is not so easy to apply the omic tools in a case of crop like wheat. Wheat has its own limitations. 
So some of the limitations associated with wheat is that uh, we do not have a standard uh, um, scale for collecting the samples. Many, many of the times when you go to the field and if I have to collect sample from different treatment, it becomes difficult because these varieties has different durations, different time. So clubbing or unifying the time of sample collection is very difficult, not only in wheat, even in other crops also. The only uh, solution is that other crops, they have a standard scale. But in case of wheat, we have only few scales like Fix or Gerard, but then that is also based on the phenotype. So sometimes it is difficult to collect sample at same stage. Second is because of large genome size and complexity, till date we have a sequence available on ensemble plants. So whole wheat genome has been sequenced, but it is highly error prone, lot of error are there and many times we are facing same problem. So we used to predict a sequence and after cloning when we match it onto the, uh, when we map it onto the wheat genome, so lot of error comes. So that is one of the problem associated with wheat. Third is uh, we have very limited information available on gene and protein in case of wheat. So when you sit on the database and when we try to find out some of the novel genes, it will be difficult to retrieve because most of the pathways has not characterized in case of wheat. Last, uh, uh, we till date we do not have a standard transformation protocol in case of wheat because of this. People they have developed construct, they are ready with everything, but then since we do not have a standard transformation protocol, it is very difficult to validate in vivo. So you can validate it in model plant, you can validate it in rice, you can validate it in other closely related species, but in the same plant it is very difficult because we do not have a standard protocol for the transgenic development in case of wheat. So now with this, uh, let me show you some of the results which we achieved at this division itself. So the title is de novo transcriptome sequencing of wheat for the identification of differentially expressed transcripts. So before taking my result, one more term which I would like to share with you is coverage. So many times when you read about the transcriptor or NGS, so this coverage will always come. So what is the depth of data which you are going to generate? So coverage is basically how many times you are going to sequence a specific base with respect to the whole genome size, right. For example, if I generate a data of 100 GB through NGS and if the genome size is 10 GB, it means my coverage is 10x. This is simple language, uh, so you should not confuse. If I generate a data of 100 GB, if my genome size is 10 GB, it means I have covered 10 X, means every 10 times I have sequenced a specific base, right. So this is coverage which is very commonly used in case of NGS and whenever you plan to go for outsourcing, that person will ask you how much coverage you require. So if coverage is high, accuracy of data will be more. So uh, this is one slide, uh, so this result we initiated in the year 2012 when transcriptome was not a very much popular in field of agriculture. That time only we initiated this, our objective was to find out some of the heat responsive gene in case of wheat. We submitted all these data and we could able to identify almost 80,000 stress associated genes. So many times when I say this number, so it gives us a sense that how to use this 80,000 uh, stress associated genes. But we identified, we characterized and we use this as a resources to clone some of the candidate genes. Uh, further we developed construct and we have mobilized in different model plants. So that is the utility output of this identification which you are going to do through omics platform. And others uh, we developed intractome also, we could able to identify some of the heat responsive microRNA also. So in coming slides I will show you what was the strategy to identify all those. We submitted this in NCBI. Uh, so for transcriptome basically uh, like for gene you used to submit in Bankit, right. So for uh, uh, transcriptome, so you have a sequence read archive of NCBI and the, the accession is called as bioproject number. Right? So when you plan to submit your transcriptome experiment data, so that bioproject accessions will come out of that and you have to submit this in sequence read archive of NCBI. Right? So we got accessions also and then uh, now we are getting citations, we publish this also. So if you see the data as I told different terms, so now when uh, you sequence, so data will come like this, you will get a table where all these informations will be there. Uh, will be there 
starting from N50 value to GC percentage to the total number of unigenes. Unigenes are basically subset of gene. This is a term of NCBI. So, it represent a family of genes. So, unigenes and then if you see up table, so there is a raw read and clean reads. So, raw read means whatever you have sequenced, clean read means you are going to remove the adapter out of that and that purified clean sequence is clean read. That you can use for aligning. Right? So, we could able to identify couple of up regulated and down regulated genes. Right hand side if you see the graph, this is basically a gene ontology analysis. So, it will tell you whatever reads you have identified basically those genes are involved in what type of biological functions. Many times when you plan an experiment, so that is curiosity that whatever gene I have identified, whether it is involved in catalytic binding, whether it is involved in photosynthesis, whether it is involved in something else. So, we want to know that. So, this GO analysis will tell you that whatever gene you have identified or transcript you have identified in which biological processes they are involved in. And once you identify this. So, here if you see, uh, so up regulated and down regulated gene. So, here also there is a term I think I have already introduced it that is digital fold expression, right. So, based on digital fold expression, you are going to claim whether a particular transcript is up regulated or particular transcript is down regulated. So, here if you see, we have a certain number that this much of transcript was up regulated and this much was down regulated. And these are the list of some of the transcripts. So, if I get this information, it will be easy for me to filter out the candidate genes which are involved in a particular biological function, maybe the stress associated genes which are involved in modulating the tolerance of the plant. So, all those information easily I can fish out and you will be surprised to know that many of these genes will be maybe it will be a hypothetical or novel gene. So, that easily you can map it on the genome if genome sequence is available and then you can design a primer and you can clone this. So, uh, based on the uh, reverse genetics, we identified some of the candidate genes. We started characterizing that we could able to predict some of the proteins and if you see here, these are some of the desirable proteins which uh, we have characterized and then one can use it for screening wheat genotype or germplasm for thermotolerance. So, once you know the candidate proteins easily you can use it as a marker, biochemical marker for screening different germplasm of wheat. Right hand side if you see, so there is a term which is called as cluster analysis. So, this is a, a k-mean clustering which will tell you how many genes are showing same pattern of expression. So, this term will tell you that this much number of gene like we have classified this data into 16 families and each family has a group of genes which shows same pattern of expression under heat stress. And the story is not only up to that much. Once you get the digital fold expression, then through quantitative real time PCR, you have to validate the expression also. So, we did some of the just I am showing here one, but we did in an exhaustive manner quantitative real time PCR under differential heat stress in different tissue with respect to some of the randomly selected candidate stress associated genes. So, here you can easily see there is a significant difference in the expression, and when you compare this with the digital fold expression which you got through NGS. So, at least R square value correlation should be positive. If correlation is positive, it means the data which we have generated through NGS is good one. Okay? So, once you validate through real time PCR, then you can use this for the cloning. You can clone, you can characterize, you can make a construct, you can mobilize it, you can develop a transgenic, you can see the effect of that particular gene on the specific trait. So, uh, uh, when we did this experiment that time only two heat responsive transcription factor was known, only two when you search on the NCBI. So, they used to show only two heat responsive transcription factor. Now, here if you see we could able to identify almost more than 60 heat responsive transcription factors and two of our MSc student they, they completed MSc on this. So, these are the list of heat responsive transcription factor and protein which we could able to identify in wheat using the tool of transcriptome. And out of this we cloned almost more than 12, it is already submitted, we have a specific accessions with us. Uh, this is one experiment. So, yesterday Dr. Jambulkar was telling about this, even I briefed. So, this is one experiment which we did along with BARC Mumbai. So, they developed some trans uh, mutant which was quite promising one. 
at M7 stage and they wanted us to find out what are the genes which are responsible for the tolerance of these mutant with respect to heat and drought. So, we did transcriptome and if you see the table, so we could able to identify this much gene which has a SNPs associated with tolerance and few of this we cloned, now characterization is going on. So, at least because there is no other tool through which you can say in case of random mutation where mutation has taken place. But once variety is developed, we did transcriptome, we identified this and very soon we are going to have publication on this and when we shared this, they were so happy knowing that okay, these are the genes which are responsible for modulating the tolerance. So, this is one work which we did with BRC and if you see the gene, most of these genes are either signaling molecule, either heat stress associated protein, either heat shock protein or metabolic pathway associated gene. So, this is uh, one experiment. So, along with Dr. Goswami, we plan to remodel the starch biosynthesis pathway itself. So, this was uh, something in 2015 we planned that let us find out the missing links in case of a starch biosynthesis pathway. We did transcriptome in an exhaustive manner and if you see the list, these are the accessions uh, of each experiment which we generate, the data which we generated and submitted in NCBI. We could able to identify almost more than 60,000 stress associated genes. And if you see the list of the uh, proteins, so almost 125 predicted proteins which were associated with carbon assimilatory pathways and few of these data were used uh, for cloning gene also and I think uh, uh, oxygen evolving enhancer protein. So, if you recall when I was explaining eye track, so eye track says that oxygen evolving enhancer protein was the most abundant one under heat stress. And Ansip, so he did his MSc on oxygen evolving enhancer protein. He cloned few of these OEP and then he characterized also their expression pattern and then uh, protein characterization. So, these data are of relevance once you know how to use this. So, once we identify this, if you see this is the Mapman visualization. So, we started simulating the pathway. And our conclusion was that those enzymes which are involved in degradation of a starch, the expression of those enzymes increases, whereas the starch biosynthesis pathway associated uh, genes expression decreases under heat stress. So, this is very conclusive uh, uh, findings. And if you see the pathway, so all this red uh, shows the down regulation and blue shows the up regulation. And this is the remodeled pathway where we could able to pictorially present some of the transcripts which were associated with a starch biosynthesis pathway and their expression pattern. So, once you know this so easily, it will be easy for you to pick out which gene is important one and where I should target. Right? So, once we find out this left hand side if you see the tables, so these are the noble genes which are associated with a starch biosynthesis pathway, but we do not know about these genes. So, we know only few of the popular genes like ADP glucopyrophosphorylase or soluble star synthase or glucose bound star synthase or starch branching enzyme. But if you see the list here, all these genes are different from these. These are the variants of maybe AZPase, variants of star synthase, but then these uh, transcripts or genes were not known. So, if you see the list here, these are some of the transcripts which we identified associated with these genes and then we cloned few of them. So, now work is going on and maybe because it is very uh, tedious to identify and then target because most of the time when you go for amplification, it is difficult to get the amplicon because this is something we predicted and now you are going to clone through wet lab work. So, that was in brief about the uh, transcriptome which we did in case of wheat. Uh, so, output that I will show in maybe end. So, what was the utility of this transcriptome, but then I will take you to the world of Mirnom. So, microRNA, I think few of you are quite interested in this area. So, 2012 we planned that let us find out some of the heat responsive microRNA in case of wheat. MicroRNA, I think you all might be knowing that this is a small non-coding RNA molecule or uh, approx 22 nucleotides long which is which has been uh, characterized in plant animal and some of the viruses. And these are like a driver, right. So, you have a lot of genes which are setting and then there is a driver which regulate the expression of these genes. So, we thought that genes we have already identified, let us characterize the microRNA itself in case of wheat, those which are involved in uh, this defense mechanism. So, we developed, so this is the workflow chart which we developed 
which we planned in case of wheat and then we executed right hand side these are the steps which we followed like total RNA isolation, quantification, uh, library construction, then uh, cluster generation and then sequencing run. So, once we get the RNA we started characterizing this. So, these are the list of micro RNA which are conserved one right. So, there is a database which is called as MIR base. Okay, micro RNA database. So, once we identified the sequence, we mapped it on the MIR base and these are different tritcum estibum based micro RNA which we identified in case of wheat and if you see out of this TAE MIR 159, this was most abundant under control and heat shock treated condition and this is known one. Somebody has identified this, characterized this and it is already available on the database. So, we identified this much, but then our objective was to find out novel one. Then we started using the reference sequence of some of the closely related species and I will tell you I am talking about 2012, that time wheat genome was not sequenced. Wheat genome has been reported 2015 or 14, the physical draft comes and then 2017, so full proof sequence was submitted. So, 2012 wheat genome was not sequenced, that time we, we take the reference of rice, maize and sorghum and we plotted our micro RNA identified onto the genome sequence of those and then we started predicting the novel micro RNA based on our own developed pipeline. So, we uh, worked with the company people, we developed uh, different criteria and based on that we could able to identify 37 novel micro RNA in case of wheat. Once we identified this, so the, the main objective was once you identified you have to validate those micro RNA. So, we did real time PCR in an exhaustive manner under differential heat stress in different tissues and here you can see based on the real time expression data we could able to identify a uh, 5 of the micro RNA which were heat responsive in nature. So, once we identified the heat responsive micro RNA, then we started uh, identifying the targets. So, through degradome we could able to identify the targets of those micro RNA and then we got very good publication. Uh, so, we published this in functional and integrated genomics and we are getting good citation till date. So, it is referred by almost all the peer reviewed journals and our idea and hypothesis was appreciated. So, we got that time we got appreciation from um, ICR and then our director also. Uh, so, now uh, they have given us a challenge to find out how best it is possible to use micro RNA as a marker for screening. So, now we are exploring working in that particular area. So, this is one work which was done by uh, Dr. Mahesh, now he is ARS scientist uh, at Jodhpur. So, he cloned one of the micro RNA which we predicted to work as a sensor both in case of biotic as well as abiotic stress that is MIR 430. So, he isolated the micro RNA, he cloned this micro RNA and then he characterized and proved that this MIR 430 regulates the expression of one of the most abundant heat shock protein that is HSP 17. So, if you recall my presentation during proteome and during transcriptome, so HSP 17 is one catalytic saperon which has most abundant expression under heat stress. So, this can be used as one of the potential marker for screening different germ plasma of wheat for thermotolerance. So, now with this now the question is how best we can use the data of transcriptome. If you see some of these uh, pictorial graphs here the comic sense, so it really signifies the transcriptome. So, when you plan to go for transcriptome there will be used data and you will be your mind will be boggled how to use this data. So, it required a very dedicated team single person cannot take up this transcriptome, single person cannot manage the enormous data which is going to generate out of this. So, you need a dedicated uh, group of people with uh, expertise in different area then only you can get something relevant out of that. So, first utility is cloning. So, once you get information about novel or hypothetical gene, so the best part is that you can map it on the genome sequence and then you can get or you can predict the full length gene. Once you predict the full length gene, easily you can make a forward and reverse primer and you can go for cloning. Cloning is basic tool almost all of us know. So, like this we did cloning in an exhaustive manner and we clone lot of genes. So, most of the time this will be one of the objective for our MSc or PhD student and few of the SRFs they are also involved in this cloning business. Other than cloning if you see the list, so we submitted almost more than 48 bio projects in NCBI database. 
right, under different projects. We got opportunity to develop experiments to go for transcriptome. So, we submitted almost all those in NCBI database. We could able to identify almost 37 noble microRNA as I explained earlier. And then out of this, we proved four to be heat responsive in nature and then we identified a huge SSRs also. So, now uh, one uh, story which I would like to share with you is unsung hero of photosynthesis that is Rubisco activist. So, if you recall uh, during my few of the talks, so I told that Rubisco is basically present in inactive form. It is present in inactive form and it required a catalytic chaperone that is activase to convert it into active form, right. So, Rubisco activase converts inactive form of Rubisco into active form, but the problem with Rubisco activase is it is highly heat labile even if there is a fluctuation of 1 or 2 degree Celsius in temperature. So, this Rubisco activase will be defunct. Once it is defunct, it means Rubisco will be in inactive form and once Rubisco is in inactive form, so there will be no fixation of carbon and once carbon is not fixed, so the photosynthetic rate will dip. So, once we got this idea, we thought that let us develop a Rubisco activase which can tolerate a temperature maybe up to 40 degree Celsius or something like that. So, one of my student Ashok Kumar, he worked on this particular aspect. He cloned few of the Rubisco activase gene, but then we got a dedicated project from SERP DST. And then, uh, so even I got appreciation from SERP for developing a, a Rubisco activase which is thermostable. So, this was the mechanism we thought that how to develop an enzyme which should be thermostable. So, we selected the uh, we selected the tool of protein engineering, but when we searched on the NCBI database, we are surprised to know that only two genes of Rubisco activase were known at that time. So, that was the biggest challenge because information was not there then how to develop, how to get a protein, how to go for protein engineering. So, we did transcriptome in an exhaustive manner and based on the transcriptome data, we could able to identify 12 Rubisco activase from those data and not only we identified. So, we started cloning um, by giving this work to some of the MSc students and in our project, some of the SRFs, they were dedicated, they were uh, assigned this work and then we cloned almost 10 of these Rubisco activase. We cloned also, we submitted in uh, database also and once we cloned this, then we started doing heterologous expression. So, we used the PMAL system to uh, isolate and purify the Rubisco activase protein, recombinant protein. So, once we purified this, then another challenge was to analyze the activity assay. So, when we started searching some of the literature, so it was very difficult because most of the methods were radioactivity based. Then we contacted Dr. Bhupender Singh and then we sit and we developed a modified protocol and when we analyzed, we got very accurate activity of Rubisco activase protein which we purified through heterologous system. So, then we did activity assay in a different manners under different treatment in different tissues under differential heat stress and then we generated lot of data. Then we planned that now it is right time that we should go for protein engineering to develop a thermostable Rubisco activase enzyme. So, what we did was we retrieved the sequence nucleotide sequence of Rubisco activase which has been reported from other plant and non-plant sources. So, once we retrieved that then we started aligning those and once we aligned we could able to identify some of the hot spots in case of those plants which are basically like cactus or those uh, like uh, a sickle cereal. So, those which can tolerate temperature up to 40 or 45 or 46 degree Celsius. So, we retrieve the sequence of Rubisco activase from there and then we align with our wheat in order to find out where is the difference and then we could able to make out that there was a difference of 2 to 3 percent variations were there in the amino acid sequence. So, we identified some of the prominent hot spots which were predicted to change the structure of Rubisco activase. And once we find that, then we did protein engineering through Q5 side directed mutagenesis kit. This was primer based mutation. So, we did primer based mutation and then we isolated, we isolated the recombinant mutant protein. And once we isolated mutant protein, we did activity assay in different manners. And once we did activity assay, right hand side if you see the table, out of the mutant which we developed, one mutant showed stability up to 40 or 41 degree Celsius. Then we uh, repeated this and we did in uh, different permutation and combinations and then we could able to make out that out of the mutant which we developed, one Rubisco activase mutant can tolerate temperature up to 42 degree Celsius. Now, you think of a, a, 
a hypothesis that rubisco activates can tolerate temperature let us take up to 40 degree celsius it means up to 40 degree rubisco activates will not denaturate activity will be maintained once activity is maintained means rubisco which is most abundant protein so definitely the inactive form will go on converting into active form it means the percentage dip in the photosynthetic rate under stress so that will be not high it will be very low and some of the literatures one paper recently six months back it has been published in nature you can go and you can see that they claim that if you develop a rubisco activase and somehow if you incorporate this in the plant so we can or we will be able to increase the yield by 20 percent so 20 percent is not a small figure right and with the co2 and with the global climate change and with the things which are coming in front of us i think even if we will get success to incorporate this particular thermostable into the plant which is now difficult for us so definitely it will be a great service to the mankind so this is one story which we did and uh, one of our phd just few days back he joined ars for his training jyoti prakash so he completed his phd on this aspect so he is Jyoti Prakash and this is and it's the story is not up to the development of enzyme. So we uh, thought that let us develop a construct and go for transgenic development. So we retrieved or we procured a vector that is called as PMDC30 uh, from ABRC, Aerobdopsis Resource Center. So this PMDC30 vector has a very peculiar characteristic. It has, it has a heat inducible promoter. So our idea was that our gene should express only when there is a heat stress. If heat stress is not there, that gene should not express because that is unnecessarily it will utilize the energy of the plant. So we procured this vector PMDC30 and then we mobilize our mutant RCA sequence into this vector and then Jyoti Prakash, so he was working on development of some of the Aerobdopsis transformants using this construct. So now it is at T2 stage, so most probably after training again he will come back and he will go for a screening and let us see how successful we will be because our objective is that the transgenic should tolerate temperature up to 40 degrees Celsius without showing dip in the photosynthetic rate. So these are some of the uh, photographs and here is Jyoti Prakash. So now other than the Rubisco activase, as I told some of the candidate genes which we cloned, which we characterize in different manner, we developed construct using different binary vectors like PRI101, PRI201, PMDC30 and then most of these. So we have mobilized in Aerobdopsis and characterization is going on. So this is the output of uh, the story which was initiated with the transcriptome. So once we identify then only we are in a position to develop the construct. Suppose if you do not have information about this candidate genes, so you cannot dream of developing a plant which can tolerate temperature up to uh, 40 or 42 or 45 degrees Celsius. So this is another success story because of transcriptome we got huge SSR uh, information with us. So we started characterizing this, we shared our information with division of genetics and they did polymorphism study with some of the identified heat responsive SSRs means those SSRs which are shitting on the differentially expressed gene and they could able to find out 4 SSRs which were heat responsive in nature and from last 3 years they are using those SSRs in their own population to validate. Let us see, uh, now till date result is quite promising. So let us see, hope so that uh, maybe these SSRs will be of great use for a screening purpose. These are some of the publications which we did in this particular area. So you can type the name or you can type the division of biochemistry and you can get these publications from the uh, public domain. The future line of action is that uh, further there is a need to do lot of work as I told some, some of the limitations associated with transcriptome. So first thing is as I was asking out of 33 batch none of you have used transcriptome till date which is surprising for me. So now you know the technique, you know the lacuna, you know the basic principle behind this. At least you should use this in your own research work to, to identify something which is novel. So that will empower you and definitely because this is cutthroat competition and if you do the basic it is good that we should do the basic but then we should use the uh, advent or innovative tool also to develop something which is novel which has utility in your further downstream research work. So uh, there is a need to use this for characterizing some of the pathways which is still lot of work has to be carried out to characterize those pathways. We, uh, we have to use this omics to develop some of the markers which we can use for a screening purpose so that that will be a help for the breeders. 
this tool can be used to remodel the pathways then we can also identify some of the SNPs and SSRs associated with not only heat stress for the sake nutrition for the sake some other stresses so for any trait you can link this so you can use this tool to find out those informations which is very difficult to identify in other cases. Then you can also this tool will help you to enrich the genetic resources. When I started my talk I told you that that time there was not much information available on public domain. So that should not be the feeling like in case of pearl millet we are struggling hard to get some of the genes which we really want to clone because information is not available. So this is the onus is on us to enrich the genetic resources of some of these crops which are very important for us. And last is that there is a need to develop the interactome of all these genes and protein. So if I know who are the person who are interacting with me, so it will be easy to, to devise to predict the output. So output depends on the team, how you have formulated the team. So similarly here the output of the gene or protein depends on what type of interaction is going on. So interaction is very important and I think yesterday Dr. Bhupender Singh also highlighted the importance of interaction with respect to ionome. So similarly here also interaction is very important, interaction among the gene, interaction among the protein, interaction between the protein and the genes. So all short of combination is very important. So definitely if, if we know the limitations of this, so definitely this tool is very important for us also and, and we should utilize this information to design our research work and to get something which should have a utility in day to day activities. So with this brief I would like to acknowledge director IRI, joint director research IRI and head division of biochemistry because Shelly ma'am she is team leader and she is closely taking care of all the expandments which we are planning and we are getting very enriched input from ma'am. So she is very interested in all this technology and we could able to achieve this much because of the uh, uh, very aggressive mode of working of ma'am. Then uh, Dr. Vishwanathan sir, he is coordinator school of basic science and he is uh, co-PI and PI of some of my projects. So we are working in a team and if you see my paper in almost all paper he will be there. Dr. Himanshu Pathak, he is director NRRI and uh, some of the experiments which I quoted here 2012-2014. Uh, so I got fund from Dr. Pathak because he was PI of one of the mega project that was NICRA. Dr. G.P. Singh, director IWBR. So that time he was principal scientist at Division of Genetics and most of the accessions and SSR based work which I presented here that was done by Dr. G.P. Singh and Dr. Nilu Jain. She is also principal scientist at uh, Division of Genetics IRI. Uh, Dr. Suneha Goswami, so she is co-PI in almost all of my project and she al always used to give a very interest input in most of the experiments. All my RA, SRF students and a special thanks to Naheb Kast, uh, especially Dr. Vishwanathan for giving us opportunity to organize this training program at this center. So with this brief note, I would like to thank you. If you have any queries, any questions, I would love to answer. Any questions, so you can ask. <coughs> Take that mic. Thank you, sir, for the presentation. The work was very impressive and exhaustive. I would like to ask uh, one thing about nano oxford. You mentioned all the good points about it. If there are any darker side to it, because if we are planning to get our samples done, so we should know. And aware of everything. Yeah, the problem with nanopore is first problem is that error rate. So it has also same error rate what I have flashed in case of other technique. But then advantage is more than the problem. So if you see the error rate at least because other platforms also they are giving same error rate, little bit high, little bit low. But then if you compare the price and the extent of data which you are going to get, so nanopore is always on the plus side as compared to the other platforms which we have. Second thing is as I told nanopore is uh, transportable. As I told here also you can execute that experiment. But if, but if you have to use Illumina you have to find out the nodal point where that instrument is established and, and it is very difficult also nowadays in spite of so many revolutions is still accessing any of this platform is tough work now. But nanopore 
so easily you can use that at any place. And second thing, cost. Nano 4, exact cost I don't know, but then it is cheaper as compared to other platform which were. So problem of error rate is common for all, but then advantage of Nano Pore is more than that of other third generation platforms which has been devised. And yesterday there was a news by Illumina that they are coming with a novel platform that is Nexi 1000. This is new platform, advantages that we don't know. Yesterday only it came into news. So definitely this company people, they are working a lot to, to rectify these problems and to come out with some uh, advent technology. And nowadays these, uh, these uh, private companies, they are working on a specific objective based mode. Right for clinical, so they are now designing a separate for agriculture. They are designing a separate. So based on need, they are designing nowadays. But still, for a student, for researcher, for agriculture field, I think Nanopore Oxford is a revolution. Okay. Sir, and about the library, you said uh, it's better you start working and making your library than depending on the companies. So if we can store it, because. As for you people also, you have to travel to NIBP to get it done, the sequencing. So if we can store the library also. Yes. Uh, see, this library is same as you are preparing in case of your cDNA library or genomic DNA library. So there are certain protocols, precaution which one has to follow. But why I told this? Because suppose as a scientist, I am giving my sample to some company people. Now what they are doing with that sample, how that sample is traveling from my lab to the company uh, people sequencing place how that sample they are utilizing for the isolation of RNA, how they are using for the run, what criteria, what precaution they are using, I don't know. Whatever data they will give, as one of the speaker he was telling, you have to accept it, right? So the best way out is, since all are kit based experiment and we are very competent to use the kit and other precautions associated with the kit are same as you are doing daily wet lab work in your place. So once you have a kit, you, you prepare high quality RNA with the sample. So at least you have a feeling that this is my sample. I have to take full precaution. When you are preparing library, at least you know that I have paid lakhs of rupees for this. So there will be a feeling attached with this and you will put your 100% to execute that. But these company people, since they are getting exhaustive samples, lot of samples will be there and they have lot of pressure on that. So it will be in a fast forward mode and most of the time the objective of the experiment will be missed. So it is because of this, easily you can make a library, you can keep some of the precautions which has been listed over there and you can transport it to the place where you want to sequence. So that is not an issue, not at all issue. The only thing is you need to have a determination that yes, I can. Even if I commit a mistake first time, so definitely second time, it will be a win and win situation. Most of the time, the first step itself is tough one. We'll think, oh, why to take so much pain? Let us outsource this, right? This is a problem with most of us. Thank you. Welcome. Anybody else? No, anyway, even if uh, afterwards, if you have any questions, so you can ask. You want to ask something, share? No. So, no problem. Even after this talk, if you want, you can ask. So, yesterday only, we were, while we were discussing about this training program and schedule, so we thought that almost all the different dimensions of omics we have completed in one or another lecture. But one thing was missing there, that is transcriptomic. So immediately Dr. Kumar, he has accepted this as a challenge and he told that, yeah, okay, tomorrow we will give a talk, I will give a talk on this transcriptomic so that we will cover all the different dimensions of omics. Like we have already completed proteomics, epigenomics, nutriepigenomics, then phenomics, this was the missing link. So today I am very much thankful to him that he has accepted it as a challenge and fulfilled that uh, missing links. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. So now I think we